Шановні колеги, дуже добре дня ще раз. Ми раді починати нашу сесію, яка називається «Зміщуючи націю. Мова, освіта, інклюзія». І нагадаю, що ця сесія була, власне, однією з тих ідей, звідки народилася наша конференція, оскільки українсько-дейські зустрічі «Центру Нова Європа» спала думку така, Така ідея, що, можливо, в мовно-освітній ситуації Україна може повчитися в Ізраїлю, може запозичити ізраїльський досвід. Сьогодні ми маємо на нашій панелі спіклів, які, власне, можна говорити і про мовні питання, і про освітні, і про мовно-освітні. Як ми буквально нещодавно бачили, що в Україні мова в контексті освіти, власне, випадкував певний резонанс і дисонанс у відносинах з сусідами на петиційному року у зв'язку з прийняттям нового закону про освіту. Отже, сьогодні я рада вам представити наших спікерів з Ізраїля. Це пані Ейна Твілл, голова комітету ІГНЕСЕТУ з освіти, спорту і культури у 2010-2011 роках. Та пані Арія Леводе Шпілер, приводну колоністку у університеті Музицепінальний центр Херція і українських дискусантів, які прокоментують те, що нам розкажуть ізраїльські спікери, поділяться тим, як вони бачать цей досвід, чи можливо буде стосувати до України, що потрібно Україні. Це Інна Сосун, нині віце-президент Київської школи економіки, у минулому першу спілку з міністра освіти і науки, та Володимир Колик, доктор політичних наук, старший науковий співробітник Департамент Клестра політики Інституту політичних та етнічних студій Національної академії наук. І я модератор Катерина Зеленбула «Центр Нова Європа». Після коротких виступів наших спікерів та розпосадців ми перейдемо до дискусії, поборення з аудиторією, постараємося це залишити побільше часу. І, не зверікаючи, продаю слово пані Ейна Твіл. Прошу. Thank you very much, Katya. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, this is my first time in the Ukraine, my first time in uh, Kiev. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Can you hear me? Oh, for the translation. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So, uh, it's my first time in Ukraine in Kiev. I made sure to check last night. So I did find that I have one grandfather, my father's father, who came to Israel from, it was called at the time Stanislavov, uh, now it's called, I think, Ivano Frankis. Um, so I have one grandfather there. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit, to kind of to understand the story of Israel, the language, the education, in the context of the bigger story of the creation of the modern state of Israel and in many ways the creation of a nation. Uh, the birth of the modern state of Israel is really part of the modern era. The modern era that introduced us to many revolutionary ideas, among them the idea of the nation, the secular nation state, which was really created uh, based on the ideas of the French Revolution. And as I'm sure you know, as Napoleon swept across Europe, in his mind, not a conqueror, but a liberator of Europe, uh, he brought to the Jews the revolutionary idea of emancipation. Up until that idea, if Jews wanted to belong to mainstream society, Certainly in Europe, their only option was conversion to Christianity. And even then, they were probably suspect for a couple of generations. Emancipation introduced the revolutionary new idea that the Jews can remain Jews and still be equal as members of a nation. But the nation was not the Jewish nation, it was the French nation, the German nation, the Italian nation, all the nations that were being created at this moment in Europe from various principalities or regions. Now, before that moment, Judaism was a single package. 
If you were Jewish, you were a member of a people, of a nation, of a tribe. You had a covenant with God, common rituals, common mythologies, common visions of the future of restoration. What emancipation did is that, that it asked the Jews to separate the religious part, ritual, covenant with God, from the national part. The famous saying that was also used by Napoleon was, to Jews as individuals, they shall have everything, meaning equality in the nation, but as a people, nothing. The idea was that if there is a French nation, an Italian nation, the Jews cannot be called a nation. And this was something that many Jews adopted. But if people think of Judaism as a religion, it's because of that moment in history. It didn't exist before. What happened is that when people like Theodore Herzl and others realized that this idea was in many ways, certainly in Europe, a lie. Because suddenly the Jews were being told that, okay, they may be French or Italian or German, but actually they belong to a different race. Which again was an utter invention. The Jews were suddenly being called a Semitic race. As I'm sure you know, there's no scientific basic for the notion of race. Certainly, I can assure you that most Jews were in Europe before most Europeans were in Europe. Uh, many Europeans, as I'm sure you know, came with the Mongolian invasions and others, and yet, and Jews were there since the Roman times, and yet suddenly they were being told that they belonged to a different race. And a lot of Jews be began to see the rise of this idea of anti-Semitism. And that establishing a German nation or a French nation requires the removal of these Semites. So a lot of these Jews said, okay, we get it. You Europeans, you tell us that we are equal, but you can't really treat us as equals. So you know what, when we agreed to say that the Jews are not a people and not a nation, that was actually too high a price to pay. So you know what, we are a people and we are a nation. In fact, we're one of the world's first peoples and nations. The story of Exodus, that mythology, is the story of a people and a nation war. And Zionism is born out of the idea that the Jewish people are first and foremost a people and a nation. And the question of religion is actually marginal. Uh, I can tell you, I define myself as a devout atheist. Many Jews are. A lot of people, when they hear of a Jewish atheist, they think it doesn't make sense. But it's only because they're under the mistaken impression that Judaism is a religion. As I'm sure you know, belief in God is not necessary for being Jewish. It's about being members of a people and a nation. So when the idea of Zionism was born, of establishing a modern nation state for the Jewish people, we had to go through a checklist. What does it mean to be a nation and a people? Okay, we need land, right? A nation and a people have land. Well, what is the land of the people of Israel but the land of Israel? What is the land of the Judean people? How do you say Jews in Ukrainian? Hebrew. So you say Hebrews. So the land of the Hebrews is the land where we spoke Hebrew, the land of Israel, the land of Judea. So this begins the process of trying to acquire the land from the Sultan, later from the uh, League of Nations. So land, we need land. We need a people. The vast majority of the Jewish people were living outside the land. So begins the process of what we call in Hebrew aliyah, ascendance, essentially immigration 
we begin to call upon the Jewish people to immigrate and to come to the land. So we got to have land, people, language. What is, does it mean to have a language? The people, the Jewish people, they have a language, Hebrew. We are the Hebrews. But by the 19th century, when the idea of a modern nation state for the Jewish people is born, Jews don't speak Hebrew. They know the language from scripture. They've seen it in prayers. They see the Hebrew Bible. But literally no Jew speaks it. They speak hundreds of languages except Hebrew. So in terms of building the modern state of Israel, we, got, we need to have the land, huge project, we need to bring the people, we need to restore the language. And that is one of the craziest projects. Everything about Zionism and the modern state of Israel is crazy. We now look at it as a success and we think, oh, it was almost inevitable. But we need to understand that every part of it was actually insane. The idea that a people who have not spoken a language for 2,000 years, who have only known this language from scripture, will begin to speak it as a language is an insane idea driven by a few crazy people who decide to do it, to begin to invent it, to use old words and to invent new words. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of the story of Eliezer ben Yehuda. He is the inventor, the man who's kind of the father of reestablishing the modern Hebrew language as a spoken language. He insisted on raising his firstborn child on Hebrew when almost nobody spoke Hebrew. That was a very miserable little boy who didn't speak anything for years until he could speak Hebrew. And today we have millions of people speaking Hebrew. We have Hebrew slang. We have Hebrew cur curses. So. Uh, this is an amazing story that is entirely the result of human will and mobilization. And think of what it meant to the immigrants to the new land. Jews who came to the land of Israel did not speak Hebrew when they immigrated, when they made Aliyah. But when they saw the songs in the seaport that said, Kisa, or welcome, entrance, thing of Ain. They recognized the scripture, but they didn't speak the language. So this is just to give you a sense, and we can then expand, but in building the modern state of Israel, we literally had to go through a checklist of what many other nations could take for granted. The territory, the people, the language, we had to start everything pretty much from zero. Thank you very much, Dr. Rov. Uh, Dísno, uh, taká dúže intrigujúci mi mi povedal počiatok, kde vás prosím zapýtať, to jak že vy to zrobili. My vás zapýtame, bo vás kolo trošičky pozniejšie. Uh, Dísno zrozumiela, že uh, vyklíky, ktoré podľahli v Izraeli, uh, z točky zoru stvorenia mluvy, nebo nevíc neporívajú z ukrajinskou situáciou, ale narazí v Izraeli je takož Арабська меншина. І дуже цікаво, я почути, мені буде пізніше, як Ізраїль з одного боку підтримує розвиток ібриту, з іншого боку взаємодіє з арабською мовою. Я хотіла би передати зараз слово пані Родаль Шпілер, яка, я знаю, приділить увагу в своєму виступі аспекту інклюзії, інклюзивності в освіті. В Ізраїлі є такий дуже цікавий досвід, не буду забігати на Hello everyone. Uh, again, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. It's also my first time in Ukraine, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the, uh, the day to hear all about uh, Ukrainian experiences as well. 
Um, so those of you who were in this morning's session uh, may have heard the Israeli ambassador to Israel um, talk about the Israel's most valuable resource, which is the human resource. And he did briefly touch upon uh, inclusion of special needs populations and about uh, cultivating young leadership, uh, identifying gifted children from a very young age. Um, so I'm going to expand <coughs> on those themes. Um, so I think that a key factor in a country's resilience and national strength is social cohesion, um, inclusion of all members of society, and basically for everybody in society to have positive feelings towards not only the government but towards each other and to feel that they have kind of a shared common fate and destiny. Um, and the feeling of those that we may call the weaker populations, let's say those with special needs for example, should not only be that they're being taken care of, but that they're being empowered and that their contributions are being recognized and they're being nurtured to contribute in the ways that they can uh, to the state. Um, so it's not just about inclusion, but about empowerment of leadership. Um, and this is something Israel has done very well. Of course, there's always room for improvement. Um, but I'm going to talk about three, uh, I'll give three examples which basically cover two areas uh, in which I think Israel is very good at uh, including um, all, all uh, members of society. Uh, and these are experiences um, that I have a personal um, relation to. So one is about um, the inclusion of people with special needs, particularly uh, those on the autism spectrum. So I have a son who's on the autism spectrum. Uh, he was diagnosed at age three and a half, so three years ago. Um, so that'll be one of the things I'm going to touch upon. And the other thing is cultivating young leadership. So I have the honor of being affiliated both with IDC Herzliya, which is Israel's private university, um, whose goal from the outset has been training the future leadership of Israel, um, as well as the World Jewish Congress uh, JD Core, which is the WJC's um, global network of young leadership who represent uh, world Jewry on the global stage, um, doing that advocacy work and diplomacy. Okay, so starting off with uh, special needs populations. Um, in Israel, one out of every 100 children today is diagnosed with autism. Um, as you may know, autism is a spectrum. Um, on the high functioning end is what some people call Asperger's, so people who function very well um, and uh, often have extraordinary talents. Um, and on the lower spectrum are those who may not even be verbal. Um, so my son Leo is very high functioning um, and he's also got another diagnosis of uh, attention and deficit disorder. Um, now since he was diagnosed, we have gotten an unbelievable amount of support um, from the state and that has led to him making enormous strides and he is, he's going to be starting first grade in a regular school in the fall um, with a shadow, a personal aide who will be with him. And that, for example, is completely covered by uh, the Ministry of Education and the municipality of the city in which we live. Um, so those are, that's one example of uh, some of the benefits that we get from the state that help us cope and um, help really push Leo forward. Um, just some other examples are we have three therapies a week covered by the health fund. So that can include physiotherapy, occupational therapy, parental guidance, uh, occupational therapy, um, as well as heavily subsidized therapies like horse riding or aqua therapy, uh, art therapy, movement therapy, things like that. On top of that, there's all kinds of um, discounts on different uh, taxes and bills, uh, exemption for the for waiting in line. Um, as parents, we get more uh, sick days from work to be able to take them to various appointments. Um, in addition to all of these technical things, the general approach uh, in Israel that we find is one that is very 
warm, very much like a family. Um, if we, for example, go to a meeting with someone in a government office um, and it's something to do with our son, they'll first say, oh, show us a picture of him. What is he into? And so it feels like, you know, he's not just another number. It's, and this is the general feeling across the board that uh, it's really a family. You know, the whole society is members of a family that we have a uh, mutual responsibility for. Um, and so I'll start with uh, just talking about education. So the general uh, principle in the Israeli education system is one of inclusion. So wherever possible, um, children with special needs should be integrated into the regular school system. Um, and this is both in order to ultimately integrate them into society and not have them feel sidelined, and also to foster um, understanding and respect and solidarity um, and have their the, the non-special needs peers understand um, you know, what, um, what special needs looks like and uh, not have them alienated. Um, so Israel passed a national special education law in 1998 with the purpose I just mentioned to um, encourage people with special needs to integrate into society and ultimately the workforce. And there's a whole range of options available. And so it's very much depending on the student's personal education needs and level of functioning, it's decided whether they will be in a special classroom within a regular school. And there's several different types of um, these types of classrooms. And um, there are some where the students spend half the time in the special classroom and the rest of the time in the regular, regular <coughs> school. There are some small classrooms where children both with special needs and without study with in the same class with two teachers, one who's a special ed teacher and one who's a regular teacher. Um, there's the, of course, the personal shadow option, which I mentioned um, that we chose for our son, where he's in a regular system completely, but with his personal aid. And for children who do need to be in a special setting, children who are either much more, or much lower functioning on the autism spectrum or with other disabilities, um, cerebral palsy, for example, that do need to be in a special school, there's huge efforts made to have them be as as uh, little, as less segregated and um, you know, separated from society as possible. So even in those special schools, they will have a few days a week where they go and visit a regular school and spend time with those peers. And it's you know on a case by case basis, it's decided whether you know that's a few days a week, one day a week, whatever it is. Mr. Vashpira, I would just like to ask you to round up, and we'll then be able to discuss it further. Okay. Sure. Yes. Um, okay, so I'll just go quickly. So uh, that's the education system. Afterwards in the army, there's also, you know, Israelis um, is mandatory uh, army service. And also the military makes very uh, huge efforts to be inclusive. So there's, for example, a special unit in the army for those on the autism spectrum, which identifies some of those extraordinary skills. Like, for example, um, they will be taken into a unit that um, looks at uh, aerial surveillance um, footage to look for tiny details because they have a special attention to detail that other people don't have. Um, and there's all kinds of, uh, of other units that uh, have taken people with special talents. Um, okay, I'll just round up. So maybe in the um, discussion we can talk more about the young leadership and cultivating um, young leadership and including them in, uh, in decision making. Uh, thank you very much. I think it's a very good idea. Дійсно, не поприйти зараз, наразі залишилася тема лідерства серед молодих людей. Можу підняти це питання під час обговорення. Наразі прошу до слова пані Інну Сусун поділитися своїми рефлексіями. Мікрофон, прошу перед вами. Рефлексія з приводу вашого досвіду з роботи в сфері освіти. І, можливо, ви почули щось, що ви могли прокоментувати з ізраїльського досвіду. Як корисно чи можливо? Таке, з чого в Україні треба зробити висновки. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, for the presentation. So, uh, the, uh, I, I don't know which language you should. Uh, you can speak either Ukrainian or English, whatever you prefer. We have simultaneous translation, two languages possible. Let's go Ukrainian, go one, please. Okay, uh, go for English, thank you. Um, 
Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on language issues, uh, and, uh, and for some reason the, this language issue has become an, uh, a big issue in Ukraine very recently, as, as uh, Katharina has mentioned, because the new law on education was passed in uh, September last year, and one of the uh, and the whole uh, idea of the, of the law is is, is a, the huge reform of the education system uh, to to. Uh, prolong the school year, to, to reform the, the governance model, to reform the funding model. But the whole debate uh, around the new law on education has actually focused on the issue of the language, uh, which was a bit surprising to me, which probably shouldn't have been valid. It, it, it was very surprising to me, because for me it was a very inside the education issue. It was very much about education system, about education government. Uh, and then the whole public debate is about language. So, so the law that was being developed for like five years, it all ends up in, in the media uh, with only one article being, being discussed, is the language issue. And the language issue is this, uh, how should we teach uh, uh, children in schools who come from other language uh, um, groups, not Ukrainian? And, and clearly the biggest group as such is Russian speakers, people who speak Russian at home, uh, but then there are also other minorities which are, um, which speak Hungarian or Polish, uh, uh, Romanian or some other languages. Uh, um, and, and many of those, uh, uh, many of those kids have actually been uh, taught uh, in their native language from, from the first grade up till the graduate from, uh, from high school. Um, and and uh, um, the situation is clearly different for different language groups because those who speak Russian, they would typically speak better Ukrainian, but for some groups, particularly the Hungarians, was, uh, a lot of them actually wouldn't speak Ukrainian at all, so they would only study, uh, they would only study in Hungarian and they most typically would end up in Hungarian universities after they graduate high school, so they were, they were not actually oriented towards continuing their career or life in, in Ukraine, um, and if they did try to get into the Ukrainian university, which was not often the case, uh, but their exams were actually bad, uh, so, so they couldn't uh, apply um, and get uh, admitted. Uh, so the idea of the new law was that we should provide them some training in Ukrainian. Uh, and that ended up, uh, as, as again Catherine has mentioned, uh, in, a, in a huge debate, uh, both within Ukraine, but what is more amazing internationally, because many of the uh, of the countries, well, particularly Hungary, of course, uh, for political reasons as well, uh, but have been promoting uh, the idea that Ukraine is using uh, non-democratic measures to you know, enforce Ukrainian language. Um, so, so I think one of the things that I would like to, to continue discussing is, is how do you manage that in, in Israel, because clearly you do have minorities that speak other languages, and how do you integrate that? Uh, what is the right approach? Uh, um, because for me it is clear that the kids should have some common background, uh, but they shouldn't be enforced upon them. And what is the right approach to that is, 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 is very problematic, of course. Um, and and uh, that is why your experience would, would be um, very useful. Um, another very uh, another thing that uh, um, Inat has mentioned, uh, um, well, probably you didn't say it in, in those very words, but I think that is very uh, topical here for Ukraine right now. You mentioned that the whole idea of Israel was insane and crazy. And uh, um, that is something that I'm thinking a lot about right now. And, and that, you know, that's something I'm going to say. It's, it's nothing to do with education or language at all. But um, I think this um, need for a big idea is something that we feel very much here in Ukraine. I recently had a, um, a discussion with a friend of mine, uh, and she said, uh, um, she's uh, living in Lviv, which is a western Ukrainian city. Uh, and a few years ago, they had, because um, it, it's an old city, an old, old medieval city, and uh, uh, so, so it has very narrow streets, and it, well, basically it has lots of traffic jam, what I'm trying to say. And they were trying to de de deal with a transportation issue. And they have bought uh, a new tram for the streets. So that instead of small minibuses, private owned, they would have a tram. And, and, and it was one tram at the beginning, they have a few more now. But people were so excited about this tram that they would stand uh, and wait on the, on the tram stops and they would, would pass uh, the, the first tram, if it was the old type, they would wait for the, for the new uh, tram and uh, you know, I just want to ride a new tram, it's so nice and fancy. 
and I think that is, uh, it, it's very discouraging if a tram is something that encourages us. If, if, if it's something that is the only thing that people can feel happy and, 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 and you know, proud about. Uh, and I think this need for a bigger idea, something bigger that would unite us, uh, is, is very much uh, what we feel here in Ukraine. Uh, I probably don't recognize that, right? That we, we do need something bigger than a tram, you know, and some bigger goals and bigger dream. What that dream would be is, and, and how do you formulate that so as to include everyone into that dream and not to impose it, not to enforce, is something that is, uh, again, uh, open for discussion, but clearly there should be a discussion. And I think one of the things that, um, that fascinates me about Israel is clearly the amount of intellectual work that has been put into designing the whole idea of the nation and uh, uh, thinking through how do we do that. Even if not, you don't always come up with the right answers. So, but, but the very fact of, of having this discussion is something very, very important. And again, uh, to your uh, very personal and this is a very professional story of, of uh, inclusion in, in education, I think that is uh, um, fascinating in a way that, uh, well, how do you uh, approach the very idea of inclusion? Because inclusion is something that is uh, uh, the idea that is being promoted here in Ukraine right now a lot. Uh, we are talking about including people with uh, special kids with special needs into um, into schools. We're on very early stages, so we can't say that it is uh, something that is formulated fully. But but, but there is an interest uh, on the issue. Um, at the moment, those kids who do have special needs, they're typically being taught in, in special education schools. So, uh, the big idea now is to bring them to regular schools, so they will be studying together. Um, and uh, I'm not an expert in, in, uh, in, in inclusion in school myself, but um, I'm teaching public policy. So when I'm, I'm teaching public policy to, um, to different audiences, university students, but then also civil servants and some, some adults. Uh, and one of the cases I give when, uh, when discussing public policy and, and public policy analysis, and specifically how you can uh, do analysis, I will give them a case of discussion in the one of the um, on the social media about inclusion. Um, so, so it was just a random text that I found on the on the internet. I just give it to students so that they can see how ideas have been formulated. And clearly, one of the biggest issues is is just identifying what are we dealing with, uh, who are people who are kids with special needs. Uh, because I have seen uh, uh, people using actually abusive words towards kids with special needs, uh, uh, saying that they have no place in, in, in regular school and so on. Um, or the idea is that, uh, yeah, sure, but they should be taught properly, but, but not with my kid in school. Um, and, and I think that gets us back into how do we learn to cooperate as a political entity in a way. Right. Who do we recognize as our peers? Who do we recognize as someone who is important and who should be taken care of? Um, and, I, and I think we are, again, on the very early stages over there. And I think that, um, and, and that is my question to you, is how was this idea that those kids should be taken care of uh, properly, how that has been formulated? And how did you manage to prove it to the parents of other kids? that um, it's beneficial for, for, for all of them. Because what I'm seeing now is a lot of parents are not willing to get their kids studying in, in the same classroom with the kids with a special need. Um, again, I, I do believe myself that it relates to a big issue of us not being able to live with each other and cooperate uh, on, on a rational basis and on recognizing each other's uh, worth. Uh, but also to the more practical issues, like how to explain that it doesn't hurt the education of the kids, uh, uh, of the other kids, uh, and so on. Um, and then, uh, um, yeah, and then I was amazed when you said that you have special units in the army. I mean, I've done some reading about uh, Israeli society, uh, and, and I know how important the army is to you. I would never think that that is something you can get. Uh, uh, in the army as well, and, and that is amazing. I've never heard of that uh, myself. Uh, um, but then also the whole, uh, what you were saying as, as a mother, but then also as a professional worker in the field, is that inclusion is not only about getting kids to a regular school, 
like other steps that you have mentioned, like you have, have discounts and tax reduce and, and, and something like that. It actually shows that the, the inclusion is, is an overall process. You can't just tackle it by, by just making a small step in one direction and that will not result in anything else. Um, so, so I think describing this whole system and how probably that was brought about, how that was being designed, and how did you persuade people to do that? And, and specifically, and that is something that is, again, topical here in Ukraine right now, how do you prove to other people that uh, we should pay for those kids, we should give tax reduction, and, and so on and so forth, be uh, living in the country which is basically living in the war situation, right? And, and that is something, again, uh, very crucial here in Ukraine, when, when uh, um, expenses on, on um, defense are rising, but how do you still invest in people at the same time? And how do you make those uh, choices? I think those are the questions that I would like to raise. Thanks. Pani, no, duže vam dziękuję za refleksję. Duże dziękuję za to, że już zakinęło dużo takich wektorów dla dyskusji. Wszyscy duże ciekawi. Ja nagaduję, że u nas dzieje nasz tweet BIM. Можемо використовувати його як таку онлайн-платформу для дискусії. Ви можете, наприклад, вже писати ваші запитання. Ми всі можемо бачити в реальному часі, я також. І можемо таким чином вже починати спробувати дискусію, якщо вам щось цікаво. І наразі я передаю слово панові Володимиру Кулику. Дуже цікаво почути ваші спостережні думки з приводу мови нації, націоналізму і всього, що вам спав на думку протягом цих виступів. Прошу. Uh, but what I'm saying is, I will not, I will not be covering you, your part because I'm, I'm really not, not an expert in that. Except that I strongly believe that people with special needs should be integrated as much as possible and as much as the nation believes it can afford. And, and that's what Ina was saying is, is, is an important issue uh, in, in Ukraine now. Uh, they believe. Uh, perhaps largely erroneously, that Israel um, is a rather, is a rather um, by now, affluent country. It can afford much of these fancy things uh, which come from Europe, which come from the West, yeah? So we Ukrainians cannot. But um, unfortunately, that comes at the price of believing that we shouldn't even try. Yeah, those fancy things, they start with people with autism and then with, with, with LGBT people and with Roma and with everybody else. We, we should not even try. That's, that's for those fancy, fancy people over there. Yeah, but so but what I'm saying is we should try, we should, we should look uh, into experience of wealthier and more advanced technologically and more um, older democracies and, 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 and look at how it can be done and, and at what stages you can afford and you should uh, you should try to do, to, to do uh, uh, these things and then that thing. But what I'm uh, going to, 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 to speak about is mostly about inclusion in the sense of uh, language and ethnicity. And uh, mostly what, what Enak was saying. Um, uh, of course, Israel is fancy in Ukraine and inspiring in Ukraine in the sense of uh, probably three main aspects. Uh, first, how they managed to build such a strong army and to kick uh, everybody's, you know what? Uh, second, uh, how they managed to, to, to become so technologically advanced, like to, to produce this milk in the desert. And third, and what's uh, most relevant to my, to my topic, is how they managed to revise the dead language. That centuries dead language, yeah? Uh, and of course, it's, it's fascinating and it's very challenging to us now. Ukraine, Ukrainian was not as dead as Hebrew was. Uh, there are people uh, who were born into that language. I am one of those people. I, I, I spoke Ukrainian through my whole life. At, at, at no stage of my life, any other language was my lang main language of everyday interaction. So I'm, I'm one of those lucky ones. And now, uh, in a way, uh, advantageous ones who can build on that native language experience and that way uh, I, I, I don't need to, to, to break my old habits. 
Uh, but that's clearly a minority. And if you are building a nation which believes that it should be built on that language, uh, Hebrew or Ukrainian, but which is not accustomed to speak in that language, that's a challenge. And that's uh, maybe not as, as, as big a challenge for Ukraine because there is a considerable part of the population who speaks Ukrainian as a native language and even a larger part who, who have a, uh, has a very strong command of Ukrainian. Still, uh, very many, many people do not. And uh, most importantly, many people do not want to, do not believe that there should be one language at the core of, of, of the nation and inclusion in the nation. And, and this inclusion is no, no, no less important than that, that, that inclusion of people with autism, with disabilities, uh, with any special needs. Uh, because um, that's uh, how you decide what Ina says, how you, how you recognize, um, uh, who should be recognized as your peers, yeah? Who should be recognized as your competitors? Who should be recognized as your fellow members of the nation? And that's a challenge. Uh, where does the boundary of your nation lie? And that's, that's a crucial challenge. And that leads me to something to, uh, which I would, would dare say is an elephant in the room, which was not mentioned here, and which is unfortunately, uh, we, we should not avoid that. Because uh, in addition to these things, which, which fascinate us about Israel, which as I just mentioned, there are things which uh, give us a break, which sometimes make us miserable about, uh, about Israel. And, the, and that's the, the problem of Arabs, that's the problem of territories, that's the problem of, 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 of how you build your nation without trumping uh, another nation. And, but that's not just a problem of democracy, that's not just a problem of human rights, which, which it also is. But also the problem of what, what you do with the people who live next to you or um, amidst you and do not want to belong to you. And that's now a challenge for us with regard to those people who we sometimes um, derogatory call separatists. But who are in many ways ambiguous. Uh, some of them think of themselves as Ukrainians. Some of them think of themselves as Russians. Some of them uh, want, to, want to avoid the choice and think of themselves as, as simply local, uh, belonging to that particular place, or, or, maybe, or maybe belonging to that particular uh, uh, face, like Orthodox, or, or something else. Yeah. In German terms, if you ask people in, in service, who do you consider yourself primarily, or what words characterize you, and give me uh, a list of no more than three, many people would say, I'm a man or a woman, I'm an Orthodox, I'm, 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 I'm a person from the Nets, or something like that. Yeah, because they don't want to make the choice because you, between Ukraine and Russia. It, 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 it can be complicated, it can be painful, and, and it can have political consequences, and they want to avoid those consequences. Uh, what I'm saying is we need, to, we need to listen more to Israeli experience. How you decide, for example, that some Arabs do belong and some do not. How you decide what, how much you can impose your own language, Hebrew, on those Arabs who want to belong, but maybe they won't belong as people with special needs. There's a need for, 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 for being uh, equal but different. People with, like you said, the, uh, the, 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 the brilliance and the novelty of, of this emancipation idea was we can be Jews, but we can remain Jews, but become equal, fully equal. We, we shouldn't be in a ghetto for, 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 for wanting to, 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 to remain Jews. Yeah? So what about those Arabs? Uh, and what about Russian speakers in Ukraine? Do they, do they have this right to remain Russian speaking and, and be fully equal? Or should we believe that nation is inevitable without a core language and a core set of values and a core set of, of, of beliefs and without that there is no nation? Okay, if some believe that's a too high a price for them, if they believe, if you impose Ukrainian language as the main language of, of everyday life for me, I do not, do not want to belong. How you decide whether you should force them because they happen to be on your territory when you, when you are creating your nation and, and, and state, or should you let them go? And then again, how you let them go? You let them go as physical uh, uh, beings, just, 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 just pack and, and, and leave, or you, you should let them stay here but, but not belong? And how, how, is, how feasible is that, yeah? Uh, so what do you do with people who live there? If they, are li if they are living compactly in some part of your country and it's adjacent to, 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 to a foreign country, 
do, 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 are, should you be ready to, to redraw the boundaries, the borders? Or, sh or should you believe, no, our land is taken? You mentioned how important the idea of a land was for Israel. Of course, it's, it's, it's from the Bible, it's, it's sacred, it's ancient, uh, uh, ancient and, and all of that. Um, does that mean that we have to take the land no matter what people living on that land, some of the people living on that land want? So all these questions are common for Ukraine and, and, and Israel. Maybe they, they do not sound uh, sometimes as if they are really common, they, because we, we are accustomed to perceiving our stories through different lenses, you know. Uh, but, but, but we can think of them as common and, 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 and try, try to discard them in, in a way that we can learn from your experience and maybe you can learn from our experience at least of raising these questions, if not necessarily answering them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, дійсно, прослухавши зараз всіх спікерів, всіх дискусантів, мені спадає на думку, що коли ми говоримо про empowerment, тобто посилення, зміцнення, то тут якраз можу провести цей місточок, що в якийсь момент empowerment був потрібен українській мові. Як зробити її популярною, як зробити її бажаною, як зробити її модною, так, щоб дійсно була інклюзія суспільства у широкому розумінні. Чи потрібно це, як це цього досягти, щоб це не було притиснуто згори? Я вдячна дискусантам за те, що вона дійсно окреслила дуже багато тем до обговорення, які, сподіваюся, наші шановні спікери піднімуть. Разом з тим я би зараз хотіла дати слово аудиторії, в кого є якісь запитання і коментарі, будь ласка, будь ласка, дайте мені знати, висловлюйтеся, якщо можна, коротко, а наші спікери тоді, коли ми прослухаємо так, ці, ці питання, просто будуть обирати, на що саме їм відповісти, бо дійсно тем дуже багато сьогодні. Прошу, бачу до питання. Мікрофон є? Де перекладача треба? Беркут Анатолій, Лукрес. У мене вже питання буде такого плану. Річ тому, що коли діти приходять, вони спочатку вивчають свою мову в школах, а потім ізраїльську. Ті саму, як його. Ну, не розуміло, так. Чи спочатку вони вчать ліврит, а потім на якомусь етапі, знаючи свою рідну мову, вони вчать її в школі. Проблема яка? Проблема в тому, наскільки вони встраюються в державу Ізраїль для того, щоб використовувати свій потенціал, працювати чи в приватній компанії, чи працювати в державних установах в такому вигляді. І друге питання – це практично, якщо можна, скажіть, будь ласка, останні, от, коли відбувається, от, практично я знаю, у вас дуже багато російськомовних, у вас дуже багато які знають ізраїльську мову, і третє – це у вас, ви знаєте, англійську мову, я бачу. Наскільки англійська і російська мова розмивають націю Ізраїля? Дякую. Щодо першого питання, то питання полягає в тому, коли, в який момент діти менші вчать ібрид. Правильно, Мова Ізраїль? Так. Зрозуміло, дякую. Чи є ще запитання? Прошу. Світлана Щель, Інститут економіки та прогнозування. У мене питання про інклюзивність, як в більш широкому сенсі, тому що на цій дискусії наголос було зроблено на людях з особливими потребами та на освіті. Якщо говорити про зміцнення нації і про інклюзивність, то освіта – це лише один з факторів інклюзивності. І мене цікавить ваша точка зору, як ви взагалі розумієте інклюзивність і чи, як розвивається в Ізраїлі інклюзивна економіка. Дякую. Дякую, запитання. Просимо ще. Дякую за цікаві та речі на Іваном, як і Омолянська академія. Я маю два освітні питання, але насамперед хочу подякувати за цікаві Доповіді. Дякую, що наші доповідішки вперше завітали до війни. І я маю два питання, якщо можна, саме до доктора Біл. Ем... Перше питання пов'язане з мовою. Е, Ізраїль – країна, де є дві офіційні мови, як ми знаємо, це ібри та арабська, подібно як у Канаді французька та англійська. 
в Україні офіційно тільки українська, але розуміємо, що мільйони мовців російські. І різні країни по-різному вирішують на себе, як жити цією двомовністю, та, як працювати з імперіалізмом. Дев'ять разів був в Ізраїлі, ще раз у Єрусалимі. Рух Єрусалимі як кейс. А, я ніколи не зустрічав ізраїльтян не арабів, ну, скажімо так, бо це може бути єврейського погодження і не єврейського погодження, які приїхали в контексті Алії, так? Значить, не арабів. І за винятком, можливо, професорів арабської мови, скажімо, єврейського університету в Єрусалимі, які розмовляли арабською мовою. Натомість майже всі араби розмовляють євритом. Краще чи гірше? Як вирішується це питання? Це перше питання. З вашого дозволу друге питання. А, одна з наших доповідачів, доктор Вил, є а, одним з небагатьох публічних політиків Ізраїлі, які 2012 року заперечували відкрито проти створення, проти надання Арієльському коледжу статусу університету. Ми знаємо, Арієльський університет, раптом хтось не знає, що це останній навчальний заклад, вищий навчальний заклад, який отримав статус університету. Це сталося 2012 року, якщо я не помиляюся. І це було проблемне рішення. Більшість політиків в силу політичних причин підтримували це рішення. Так? Хоча це йдеться про Самарію, про Шаврон, тобто так звану окуповану територію. А, і наша доповідачка була, як я сказав, одним з небагатьох політиків, які заперечували. Так? І я можу, і не буду цитувати, я коротко переповім своїми словами, тобто ви е, аргументували, так цікаво, трохи з гумором, якщо Міністерство фінансів і Міністерство освіти має додаткові мільйони грошей для того, щоб фінансувати ще один університет, то краще ці гроші було витратити на підтримку вже існуючих університетів. Власне кажучи, але як ми розуміємо, це не єдина проблема. Це питання, це на іншій панелі, здається, зараз паралельно говорю. Питання іміджу Ізраїлю, формування іміджу країни у світі. Оскільки створення нового університету на так званій окупованій території, це явно те, що шкодило іміджу Ізраїлю, який без того дуже багато критикують у світі. Е, і запитання до вас таке. Минуло 6 років. Чи ви не переглянули своє рішення? Як ви оцінюєте це рішення 2012 року? Наскільки це вплинуло на імідж Ізраїлю? І, відповідно, чи спричинило це до бойкоту цього навчального закладу у світі? Дякую. Добре, дякую. Наразі поставимо, давайте, крапку з кому, зробимо ще потім збір запитань. Одразу хочу сказати, що сесія щодо іміджу держави за кордоном – це одна з наступних паралельних сесій. Зараз Ніхто нічого в цьому случаї не пропускає, що хто заболівався. І я пропоную тоді нашим шановним спікеркам адресувати ту велику кількість запитань спостережень, які прозвучали. Прошу, напевно, давайте почнемо з автори. Well, uh, thank you so much for this and for the interest. Uh, I agree, there's a lot of uh, common themes and uh, issues. Sorry. A lot of common themes and issues. Um, so it's actually all connected. Uh, the language, the story, the inclusiveness. Because when we started the process of restoring the ancient but dead Hebrew language, people paid a heavy price for that. We have a very famous writer, Ephraim Kishon of Hungarian descent, He said that Israel is the only country in the world where children teach their parents the mother tongue. And the, the idea was that Jews came from around the world speaking different languages, coming to a land where the language that was being restored was a language that they somehow recognized but really didn't know. Obviously, their children spoke it much quicker, much sooner than the parents did. And the story of many Israelis is the story of the children being very quickly feeling at home, but the parents still having that sense of being, fighting with the sense of being not really foreigners, but struggling. Now, the willingness to pay this price 
comes only because of the big story. If you feel that as a people, you're engaged in a huge, inspiring undertaking to restore your people and your nation and your sovereignty, you're willing to make many sacrifices. Parents are willing to make the sacrifice of understanding that in many ways their children will be more at home than they ever will be. So the willingness to undertake all of that together at a heavy price uh, comes from the understanding that there is a big story. Uh, in many ways as a country we lost. Jews used to be very multilingual. Certainly in these regions you had Jews known for speaking ten and more languages. Now, if an Israeli can speak English not completely embarrassing, that's a huge achievement. Because we have been so uh, kind of, uh, I would say even fanatic in teaching Hebrew to everyone, to every child from the beginning, that we lost a lot of the linguistic diversity that used to characterize the Jewish people. But we did that in the name of the big story, in the name of nation building. Uh, and of course, the big story is also the key to solidarity. One of the reasons that the welfare state across Europe is under tremendous strain is because solidarity is under tremendous strain. You are willing to pay for other people's schooling, for other people's health care, for other people's needs, when you think that you are part of the same thing. But if the people are very different from you, your willingness to share with them in education, in health care, in taxes, in welfare, is much lower. So these things work together. The sense of solidarity comes with the language, with the nation, with the people, and with the story. Now, in the context of Arabic, Arabic, of course, was the language that was spoken in the region since the Arab conquests in the 7th century that came from the Arabian Peninsula to capture the entire area of North Africa all the way to Persia and made it a Muslim and Arab-speaking region. When the Hebrews begin to come back at the end of the 19th century, they are clearly beginning to butt against those who believe that the Hebrews should have already disappeared. They were certainly not supposed to come back. And their return is a massive challenge to the dominant civilization. I have an Arab colleague who says that if you want to understand Arab-Jewish relations in Israel, and notice that the definition is Arab and Jewish, two nations, not two religions, not Muslim and Jewish. He says you need to understand that in Israel, the Jews are the numerical majority about 80%. But in their minds, they're the minority. And the Arabs in Israel are the numerical minority, about 20%. But in their minds, they're the majority. Now, if you zoom out to the region, that's the case. The Jews are a tiny, tiny minority in the region. The ratio of Jews to Arabs in the Middle East is 1 to 60, 6 zero. The ratio of Jews to Muslims in the Islamic region is 1 to 120. So the Jews are clearly a tiny minority in the region, despite being a majority in their own particular state. And the Arabs, are actually the only Arab minority all across the Middle East, where everywhere else they are 100% majorities. That is a very difficult experience. 
So it's, and it's not just about the regional ratios, it's also about a mentality. The Jews have spent two millennia, centuries, knowing that they are a minority, typically a persecuted one among the nations. Everything about being Jewish, even the famous Jewish humor, comes from knowing that we are an endangered minority. The Arabs don't have the experience of being a minority. So we, the Jewish people, we need to learn to transition from being a minority to being a majority. This is a very new experience for us. And the Arabs need to transition from being a majority, and a very dominant majority, to being a minority. It's a very different experience for them, and one that many of them are not yet ready to accept. Still, a very dominant Arab narrative is that the Jews are foreigners, that they don't belong, that they need to leave, that this is not, that the land of Israel is not their home. So the Arabs are a very interesting kind of minority. They're a minority with a very clear sense that they should be the majority and that the Jews cannot properly be the majority. Now, in terms of how it works in Israel, when Israel was established, it created several uh, streams of education. The entire educational system is public, paid for by the state, but fundamentally it's divided to a Hebrew-speaking uh, educational system and an Arab-speaking. And you're more likely to see Arab-speaking schools in predominantly Arab-speaking areas and Hebrew-speaking schools in Hebrew-speaking areas. Now, the fact that Israel enables that has, as you both said, it has this ambivalent element. On the one hand, this is tremendously progressive. The state of Israel is enabling a national cultural linguistic minority that belongs to the dominant region and one with which Israel is at war to educate its children in its own culture and language. On the one hand, this is very progressive and advanced and open and multicultural. On the other hand, like was described here, this at a times puts Arabs, even though they study Hebrew in the schools, they study it from the fourth grade, someone asked how do they speak Hebrew, they have to study Hebrew in the schools, but from fourth grade, their Hebrew is not always on the level of everyone, which when they go to universities, sometimes puts them at a disadvantage. And there's a discussion of whether more should be done and what is the balance between enabling a cultural autonomy of a language and enabling inclusion and integration. But this is really the balance that Israel constantly uh, works on. But certainly, by and large, the Arabs in Israel speak Hebrew very well. I can tell you that as a member of parliament in Israel, the Arab members of the parliament uh, speak beautiful Hebrew. It does not make them uh, supporters of Zionism by any stretch of the imagination. In Hebrew, they will say some of the worst things, but they will say it in a very nice Hebrew. Uh, and I will end by only briefly addressing the question of Ariel personally, which I opposed, and I'm also about to publish an article against it. But it's come to your land, the question about land, who's in, who's out. Uh, at the end of the day, we are still facing a dilemma where even though we have a deep connection to the entirety of the land, uh, and especially, by the way, the land that some Jews call Judea, Arabs call the West Bank, 
But there is no doubt that that land has the history of the Jewish people, much of it, much more than Tel Aviv, I can assure you, and I love Tel Aviv the most. But we understand that part of allowing us to live as equals in this land is to understand that we cannot have all of it, even though we have a deep historical connection to all of it, but that also means that the Arabs and Palestinians will need to understand that they cannot have all of it, and we are still very far from getting to that moment, because again, from their perspective, they are not a minority. They belong to the dominant civilization in the region. And it is the idea of the Jews as a majority that doesn't make sense. And everything we have done, our mobilization, the price we pay, the willingness to pay a price for everyone speaking Hebrew, all came from really the understanding that we're taking on a grand project in the name of a very big idea. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bill, for your fascinating explanations. Let me now give the floor to Ms. Rodel Shapiro to read the questions to you, please. Thanks. Um, and that partly, some of the things you said also will help me answer the questions that were addressed to me, which is, uh, for example, you know, when you were saying, you know, how do you explain to the parents or how do you prove to society in general that um, A, their kids will be okay and might even benefit from studying together with special needs children, or why should all these resources um, be, you know, given towards um, special needs populations? And the answer is also, it's uh, solidarity, it's social cohesion, it's part of this big story that we're building you know, uh, a, a new nation where we are all a family. And by the way, this does include also minorities, including Arabs. Of course, all of these resources go to, um, you know, all, all groups in society. Um, regarding the question you asked, um, and you were saying that here it might be, you know, it's somewhat of an issue of people saying, well, why should my kids study with, uh, with these kids? First of all, it's important for me to emphasize that the it goes very much on a case-by-case -case basis. So together, the decision that we came to to send our son to a regular school with a shadow was together with representatives of the Ministry of Education, the school, um, his teachers, his therapists, you know, we all discussed it and we thought, okay, he will be able to integrate into a regular classroom with some help. Perhaps another child <coughs> would say, well, you know, this child may be in some ways, I don't know, disruptive, or maybe the child has, I don't know, violent tendencies that would, um, you know, threaten the, you know, the way that the other students would get by in the, in the classroom. And so for that child, they may say, okay, you know, this child should go into a special classroom and maybe over time, he or she can be um, integrated for half a day into the regular school. So it's not just one blanket solution um, because at all costs, every child must be integrated. Um, it's very much on a case-by-case -case basis, decided along with the parents, with input given, you know, from all the relevant uh, parties. Um, regarding the army, again, like you were saying, that the Israel Defense Forces is the people's army. It's kind of the great equalizer of Israel, where all different walks of society come together. Um, and people on the autism spectrum, or with um, most just recognized disabilities are exempt from service in the army, um, but they're allowed to volunteer. Um, and so for those who volunteer, there are these special units. And the idea actually came from two ex-Mossad um, professionals who realized that many people on the autism spectrum have this comparative advantage in a lot of ways. And I said, well, if these people want to volunteer for the army, let's make a unit where we can really use them. And it's also another thing that for people who don't do the army, they're often both kind of symbolically and sometimes practically, they can feel sidelined in society because it's mandatory, it's an experience that everybody goes through. 
you can be at a bit of a disadvantage if you haven't done it. So volunteering and being integrated into these special units, um, you know, that can help them, for example, get a job in Israel's booming tech industry after the army. So it's really helping to integrate them into society. And by the way, this, these programs are, of course, you know, paid for and, um, you know, put, put together through the Ministry of Defense, but it's also with the help of different NGOs and civil society. Um, so there is this initiative called Special and Uniform, which is run in conjunction with the Ministry of Defense, with the Jewish National Fund, with some private charities. So it's not that the money is only coming from the government. It's, it's really a joint effort of uh, civil society and, um, and the government. Um, and in terms of the paying for the resources, so like I was saying, Israel is in many ways, you know, has this kind of social welfare system, so the funds for these therapies and for covering um, AIDS in schools uh, comes to a large degree from the National Insurance Institute, which every citizen pays into. Um, and it comes out of the health funds, which every citizen pays into. And like I said, the, you know, one-eighth of Israeli society um, has some kind of disability. Uh, like I said, one in 100 children are diagnosed with autism. It's very widespread. So in almost every family, extended family, you have somebody who could benefit from these resources. So I think everybody, I don't feel like there's any resentment, like why should, why should my taxes be paying for this, for this child? Because everyone kind of feels responsible for each other and everyone knows somebody who needs that kind of help. And people might think, well, maybe I will need that kind of help. Maybe my child will need that kind of help. Um, so it's really a sense of responsibility for each other. Um, what were some of the other questions? Somebody asked about inclusion um, in the economy as well. So there, Israel has passed legislation, of course, to include a special needs population in the workforce. So a law was passed, for example, um, in the government that every government agency or association has to include 5% of their workers, um, of those who are recognized as having disabilities. So the Knesset was actually the first uh, government body to um, take on this, uh, this task and actually employs more than 5%, I think, um, of, the, of the quota. Um, so that's just one example. Um, were there any more? Questions for me? Uh, I think you can answer them all without having numbers. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. This is all very valuable experience. I would just like to suggest to uh, stay for five minutes longer since we started a bit, a little bit later. I've seen a question from uh, Leonid Thunberg. Maybe someone else would like to ask a question. Uh, then I would suggest. Uh, to uh, give floor very briefly for discussions, maybe we also want right now to share some opinions and observations of what they've already heard, and then including remarks from the uh, from the speakers. Tasha Prosho Shanona Auditoria, that Prosho Leonid the panel on it to him, but I'm very well as a pattern. Thank you, Sikir Pometa. Was was a pattern, thank you. Prosho Pometa. Я вдовець Леонід Фінберг і Майданська академія. Скажіть, будь ласка, досвід Ізраїлю по впровадженню івриту як національної мови, як мови державної. Яку книгу ви порекомендували нам для видання, для того, щоб це було більш грунтовно представлене для нашого суспільства? Дякую. Прошу чи ще запитання? Прошу, Сергій Стуканов. Дякую, Сергій Стуканов, громадське радіо. Насправді надихає і вражає єврейський досвід, ізраїльський досвід з відродження мови іврит. Насправді, 30 років тому Україна так само поставила перед надзвичайно складним завданням, адже українська мова була руками опослідженою. І я думаю, що саме в публічній сфері дуже дискримінована. Але ми таке завдання поставили зробити її домінантно в Україні. 
Ну, але так само чулися такі голоси, що, мовляв, ідея довкола мови об'єднувати націю, на ґрунті мови об'єднувати націю є сьогодні вже не сучасною, це в 19 сторіччі можна було таку ідею розвивати, це в 20 сторіччі, а в тоталітарних державах була ідея о одноманітнення суспільства. Сьогодні, мовляв, це є не актуально. На ваш погляд, що сьогодні чим можна обґрунтувати ідею відновлення єдиної мови для нації? Дякую. Дуже дякую за запитання. Дуже коротко, прошу. Коротко, я Людмила Олійник. Дуже досконало ми сьогодні обговорили всі аспекти, за якими ми можемо робити висновок. І таке питання. Дивлячись з історичного ракурсу, погляду, що єднає націю, чи вдалося нам, принаймні, за 25 років і різних діаспорам, вормінам думків, думок, що Україна розпочала процес явний, якому вже ніщо не може перешкодити і зашкодити і поставити перепони у відновленню українського ладу і порядку, який є виключний від імені українського народу по відношенню до інших народів на планеті Земля, які вже прийняли рішення в 45-му році допомагати один одному, і Україна розпочала цей процес відновлення ладу і порядку в частині прав власності на національне багатство. Як ви, діаспора, як ви використовуєте цей досвід для обговорення, що Україна – це співвласники національного багатства, що тут тільки виключно народ України є власником, і питання мови, і знання багатьох мов, воно таке, яке може спільно нам допомогти в цьому процесі. І ми можемо спільно рухатися з оцими економічною формулою оцього великого алгоритму території гідності. Дякую. Дякую. Я прошу зараз з короткими завершуючими ремарками, давайте з воротному порядку, Володимир Кулик, Інна Сусун, пані Аріель і пані Елєнт. Прошу, пане Володимир. So, uh, thank you for your comments, your responses to, to, to your comments on my comments and your responses to my comments. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great, it's a great uh, formula that you offered that uh, now Jews are a majority but uh, think of themselves as a minority and for, uh, for Arabs it's the other way around that there should be a transition. And it, 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 we see much of that in Ukraine as well. Uh, Ukrainians being uh, ethnic Ukrainians or increasingly uh, Ukrainian speakers, uh, regardless of the numbers, think of themselves as a, as a, as a humble minority and, 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 and do not feel entitled to what any uh, uh, community, any group with, uh, with such numbers would feel entitled to. And, uh, uh, when, um, when they are taught to be kind of uh, more audacious, more uh, more uh, resolute about about claiming those rights. Um, sometimes they are told that it's not democratic, but you know because there are minorities which, which should be taken into account, and minorities sometimes feel entitled to more than the numbers warrant. And and, and, and the Russians and Russian speakers are a case in point. Post imperial people are those normally. Uh, uh, Arabs were not a normal uh, empire in that sense, even though it was it was staged widely. Yeah, but but in, uh, European uh, empires uh, taught their their dominant people to 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 feel entitled to everything. Yeah, and and Russians are no no, no, no exception. Uh, they feel in whatever part of the USSR they they, they, they felt that when, when they approach a group of people, everybody should should switch to Russian. Yeah. And so this logic of, of uh, linguistic accommodation and cultural accommodation still is prevalent in many uh, practices in Ukraine. And, and we should be careful not to, not, not to discriminate Russians and Russian speakers, but at the same time to claim uh, 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 for the majority something which, uh, which is appropriate for the majority. But, but uh, a more general question remains. You mentioned that 
uh, when uh, th there is this dilemma uh, uh, of education. If you uh, give a minority education in minority language, you put uh, this minority at a disadvantage in the majority dominated practices, uh, uh, higher education and then job market. Yeah, uh, uh, but that raises a, 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 another question, which was kind of bracketed here. Uh, why shouldn't the higher education and the, the job market be using more of that minority language? Uh, you you, you, you uh, definitely uh, base your answer on the assumption that it's obvious why, because the majority is a majority. Majority would not be um, uh, spending uh, its time and its resources to, use, uh, to, to learn and then use the minority language. Uh, but that's a kind of majority domination approach, yeah, and uh, we, we cannot yet afford that approach because Russian speakers would not, not let us, but many in Ukraine definitely would love to. And so, uh, but there is a much another question, why, why shouldn't it be like in Canada, where many Anglophones are now taught, encouraged, in some practices forced to, to learn the minor, uh, minority language, French, to make the situation more symmetrical. Why should this situation uh, remain asymmetrical, yeah? But, but, but also a very important point you mentioned is a price of a, a national revival. And this is the price of losing your multilingualism. We are now told, with, with, with references to the Western world, to, to the globalized world, that multilingualism is, 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 is a huge asset. Yeah? Nobody would, would deny, starting from our president, uh, who, 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 upon assumption of the office, told us that look in this world you need English. Yeah, sometimes he forgot that he, you, 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 you should first need to learn Ukrainian. Yeah, so uh, we need to know the price. The price is if you if you place a huge premium, uh, make a focus on your national language, you would lose some multilinguals. But maybe you should be willing to. Yeah, that, that that's an important issue. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I do realize uh, I'm, I'm uh, competing with lunch, uh, so I, like, there is no way I'm going to win this competition. Uh, I, I would just like to highlight this idea that, that Ariel has mentioned, is that uh, inclusion only works on the idea of the solidarity. Uh, and again, I think uh, that that is not the word that we, like, the very word is not something we use a lot here. We talk about unity, but we never talk about solidarity. And I think, uh, why is that so? Why are we are not actually using that in our vocabulary, in our political vocabulary, in designing our political nation, our political ideas? Uh, um, I think you were talking so much about solidarity, and that it can actually bring this sort of outdated idea back to the political discourse here in Ukraine. I think that is. Uh, uh, very useful both in terms of discussion on, on the language issue, on inclusion and everything else, is that it only works on, based on the idea of solidarity, of recognizing the worth of, of, uh, of your peers, and then, uh, is, um, just with the down here, uh, is, 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 is if you recognize someone as part of your community, I think that is a very strong message from this discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, thank you. Um, yes, I'm surprised to hear that, and I never thought about the, you know, the very nuanced, subtle difference between unity and solidarity. Um, and that's interesting. But I would say that Israelis feel that solidarity is um, a matter of survival. I would even say because if you ask most Israelis, you know, what's the biggest threat? I guess I might say Iran. Some, but I think on the whole, most would say our internal, domestic um, solidarity and unity, and you know, including the Jewish diaspora, actually, as well. Um, but I do think that in Israel, that's seen as a really important challenge and something that we have to maintain in order to survive. Thank you very much. I think that this thesis about inclusion, it is very correlated with what we heard in the last plenary session, when we talked about the fact that there is a resource of the people. Ізраїльський досвід показує, наскільки цей людський ресурс використовується на повну потужність. Прошу, пані Ейнат. Нагадаю, питання, які лишилися неадресованими, це книга щодо вивчення, відродження мови, яку варто було видати в Україні, 
і аргументи щодо того, чи може бути нація сформована і консультована на підставі мови. So, uh, in terms of publication, uh, I do want to say that one of the most interesting elements of the revival of the Hebrew language, because it was a part of this grand project, is that you had top intellectuals mobilized for the effort. You had uh, the smartest people writing books for children. You had some of the smartest people going to be teachers in schools because the feeling was that we are undertaking something dramatic. And although I don't have a book for you on this story, if you do have a chance at one point, I recommend that you invite here a man by the name of Gil Chovav. He's the great-grandson of Eliezer ben Yehuda. And everywhere in Israel, there will, the, one of the main streets is always ben Yehuda Street because we prize the man who revived our language, but he will tell you wonderful and funny stories about his family, and I highly recommend that. Uh, I'll uh, end by saying that at the core in Israel, there are two nations and people, the Jewish people and the Arab people. Uh, it is almost nonsensical to speak of both of them belonging to the Israeli people. There are those who try to say that, but it doesn't work. I have an Arab colleague who is uh, a diplomat in Israel's foreign ministry. And he sometimes meets with Arabs and Palestinians, and they tell him, there's no such thing as a Jewish people. It's a very common Arab and Palestinian notion. It's only a religion. There's no such thing as a Jewish people. So he asks them, OK, so what is there? They say, okay, there's the Israeli people. He says, okay, so what am I? And then they get stuck because it's very clear to them that he's of the Arab nation. He's an Arab, he belongs to the Arab people. So fundamentally in Israel, we have a civilian state, Israel, but within that we have two linguistic nations, the Jews and the Arabs, even though the Arabs speak Hebrew. Now you asked about the Jews speaking Hebrew. Uh, for many, many uh, centuries, Jews spoke Hebrew because they lived in North Africa, in Syria, in Iraq. Arabic, sorry, they spoke Arabic, living in those countries. They lost it as part of rebuilding the nation. And there is always discussion about teaching Arabic. Arabic is taught in the schools. But because Arabic is still perceived as the language of our enemies, even when children learn it, they later they don't want to speak it. We Israelis cannot visit Arab countries. So when are we ever going to use it? Uh, I mean, again, we can use it with, to speak with the minority, but if you think, okay, English, we can speak everywhere. French, Chinese, Arabic, we can't even go there. So the motivation ultimately to learn another language, you need motivation. The motivation for everyone learning Hebrew was the story of national revival. The motivation for learning Arabic is right now fairly low because it's considered the language of our enemies. We can't use it if we travel. Um, and when people learn Arabic, it's typically in the context of learning it as the enemy's language. We will learn it in the military, in the intelligence services, but not so much uh, as a language of a culture to which we want to be a part of. There is still that sense of cultural and linguistic rivalry. And I'll just end by saying that one of the funny outcomes of the tremendous success of the revival of the Hebrew language and of Israel and Zionism is that the Jewish people are now pretty evenly split between Jews living in America who speak English, rarely speak Hebrew. When they are religious, they will know the texts and the prayers. 
and Jews living in Israel who know Hebrew, but to a large proportion are, lar are likely to be not religious. So sometimes people joke that when you bring American Jews and Israeli Jews together, and they will engage in some Jewish religious ceremony, the American Jews will know the text and the songs. The Israeli Jews will actually be able to read it, but they will not know it. Uh, so there's always changes in prices when you're involved, engaged in this process. But by and large, it's truly a remarkable story and one that raises many common questions. Thank you. Szczerze dziękuję, szczerze dziękuję naszym szanownym speakerkom. Tak właśnie szczerze podziękuję naszym szanownym dyskusantom, że się znaleźli czas i dołączyli do tej dyskusji, spróbowali ją i taką że formułę. Zwyczajnie bardzo dziękuję wam, szanowni dyrektorzy, za to, że wy взяли участь у цій дискусії. Нагадую, що попереду у нас ще дві, паралельні, дві пари паралельних сесій. А прямо наразі обідня перерва. Запрошуємо всіх в тій самій залі, де був кава-брейк на першому поверсі біля залу Болору. Щиро дякую всім.